Good evening, everybody. Please stand and join us in a singing our first song, He Knows My Name.
ladies and gentlemen, my name is Jasmine Sotella. I'm a freshman here at FAA. Welcome to our last revival series. Hello, my name is Rachel Garcia and I am also a freshman and we hope you receive a blessing from our last revival series uh, done by all the students here at FAA. Join us as we sing for the last time our theme song, Heart of Worship. much deeper within to the way things happen. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry. Dear God, uh, please bless this last meeting. Please come into this room with your Holy Spirit and help everyone here to be touched. We love you so much and hope to see you soon. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. to make sure that you are aware of something, and that is that all of the material from the songs to the sermons to the skits is original material. 
These students have worked very hard in preparation. This is not a pre-scripted where we gave them the sermons and said, here, preach this. They, they crafted it on their own um, through God's help. And I just wanted you to make sure you knew that and were aware of that. As I said last night, we're going to do something tonight that we haven't done all week. And we're going to take up, take up one offering. And this offering is going to be for one purpose. And it is going to be to enable us to, to do other events, other mission, other outreach in the future. And so at this time, I have some students who have been asked to take up the offering. If you guys can come up to the front, we're going to have a, have a prayer. bow our heads. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you so much. Father, thank you for what you have done through our students this week. And Father, I would ask that this offering that is given tonight, Father, I'd ask that you would multiply it, that you will bless it, Father, and that this, this week will just be a spark, Father, of things to come in the future for what you want to see happen through our students and by our students for your honor and your glory. In your name I pray, amen. Ready or not, by Lisa Rubush. Look. I see it. What is it? Looking. Looking. Watching. Watching. Wondering. Wondering. Aware. Unaware. Understanding. Confused. Anticipation. Apprehension. Expectant. Surprised. Excited. Worried. Exuberant. Scared. Amazement. Afraid. Sheer joy. Terrified. Relief. Horrified. Thankful. Wishing. Assuredness. No hope. Finally. Too soon. Glorious light. Light too bright. Wonderful sight. <laughs> Horrible sight. Reunited with loved ones. Wanting to die. Escorted by a personal angel. Rocks fall on me. Meet Jesus. Ground swallow me. See a scars. Please let me die. No pain. No life. No sickness. Dying. No worries. Dead. Eternal life. Eternal death. Heaven. Heaven.
Can you believe that today is the last day of our revival series? I know that I personally have been blessed, and I hope you have also. To start today, I want to ask you a question for you to just answer in your heart. What's the one thing that you long for the most? If you had one chance to get anything you want, or ever could want, what would you choose? To the majority of people, it might be a high paying job, or to look better, or to lose weight. To some, it might be being comfortable, or staying in your comfort zone. Being safe, living longer, world peace, getting an A on your math test, going to college, or finding a job. For your parents to stop fighting, to find a friend. These can all feel super important to you. But let me ask you for a second to look beyond the here and now and go deeper. In your heart of hearts, in your innermost self, you are longing for something that can only come from Jesus. In the Bible, in Philippians 3, verse 20, it tells us something pretty spectacular. It says, but we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our savior. Our citizenship, where we belong, what we long for, what will make us complete is to be with Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, please fill this room with your Holy Spirit. Thank you so much that you love us and that you died for us. Please use me to speak to someone tonight. God, help people see you. Amen. My dad was born in Australia. You know, Ayers Rock, Kangaroos, Vegemite, the accents, all that good stuff. I guess that kind of makes me part Australian. Now, let's just say you were going to visit Australia. If it were me, personally, I would want to get some advice. So, before you go, I need to teach you a little bit about where you're going. First of all, you need to be prepared for a long flight. <laughs> the flight from, okay, so first of all, you need to be prepared for a long flight. The flight from San Francisco to Sydney, Australia is about 15 hours. Also, you will be in a completely different time zone. In other words, what would be 11 p.m. Sunday here would be 6 p.m. on a Monday in Australia. They are 19 hours ahead of us. Also, the seasons are flipped. It's the end of winter here, while in Australia it's the end of summer. Another confusing thing is that in Australia, instead of driving on the right side of the road, you drive on the left. That also means that the driver's seat is on the right side of the car instead of the left. Confusing, right? In order to gain some of the true Australian experience, you have to be able to understand some of the phrases and accents. Australians call themselves Aussies, yet I'm talking in an Aussie accent. And they call each other mate, Flip flops are thongs. The boot is the chunk of the car and the bonnet is the front. G'day is hello. To veg out is to relax in front of the TV. Most of you have heard of Ugg boots. Those are Aussie. They're actually meant for surfers to keep their feet warm while out of the water. And lastly, the bush. That's what Aussies call the outback or the place in the middle of nowhere. Pretty weird, right? Another difference between Aussies and Americans is their sense of humor. Many Aussies are sarcastic in a way that almost sounds really rude, but when you dish it by right back, you both can have a really good laugh. In Australia, we, all, we have all sorts of strange, awesome animals, such as the koala, the platypus, the huntsman spider, the cockatoo, dingoes, and lastly, kangaroos. And lastly, kangaroos, or ruse as, Amer as Australians call them. But one of the most important parts of Australia is the food. I have recruited three people from my class to help me today, and I'm gonna ask them to come up now. So 
So um, this is Samantha, this is William, and that's Samuel. Okay, great. Today you are going to try Vegemite. Just to be clear, they have never tasted this before, and I don't think they have any idea of what they're going to be eating. Okay, in Australia, one of the main meals or snacks is a Vegemite sandwich. So I have some bread, butter, and cheese, and Vegemite here with me. Now you can make a more interesting sandwich, obviously, by adding lettuce, tomatoes, maybe meat, I don't know. I didn't bring any of that stuff, so you'll just have to have the basics. I'm gonna have you smell it first. <laughs> okay, here you go, an Aussie sandwich. <laughs> Oh, just so you know, if you find it so awful that you can't swallow, here's a rubbish bin and a serviette, just in case. <laughs> okay, <laughs> go. like dog food. <laughs> okay, Samantha, what about you? That was honestly the most disgusting thing I've ever tasted. I personally love it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, here's a minty for your breath. It's another Aussie snack. Um, yeah, <laughs> and you can go to your seat now. Thank you. Now you, have a, you can have a small taste of the contrast that my dad experienced when at age 18, he flew to America all by himself to go to college. But you can also understand the excitement when almost 10 years later, he got to go back to his homeland. As soon as he arrived, he felt at home again. The people, the accents, the air, the animals, and the food were so familiar and comforting. Imagine in your mind what you might call home. It could be a certain house, maybe a town, or even a country. To my dad, it was Australia. Wherever it is, you all know that while it's nice to travel sometimes, coming home always brings that feeling that you belong. God has a perfect homeland waiting for us. He says in Revelation 21, verse 4, that he will wipe away every tear from our eyes and there will be no more death, or sorrow, or crying, or pain. All these things are gone forever. 1 Corinthians 2.9 tells us that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. Isaiah 65 verse 17 reminds us, look, I am creating new heavens and a new earth and no one will even think about the old ones anymore. Philippians 3, Jesus Christ lives. And we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our savior. You and I belong in heaven. Heaven is our home. So, we are citizens of heaven, 
but we're stuck here on this earth. Well, what are we supposed to do while we wait? The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 20, so we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. An ambassador is an official representative who is sent from one nation to another on a temporary mission. Becoming a U.S. ambassador can be an extremely long, difficult process. You have to climb the ladder of law very carefully. By that I mean graduate and work your way up in politics. Then, once you get high enough in the system, most likely it'll take about 20 years, you either have to donate a ton of money, by that I mean millions, to charity, or else be super close to the president, all of which takes a bunch of time and effort. Even then, you would probably only get appointed to an unimportant country first. It would take a while to receive the president's trust, but once you do, you would probably be appointed to a more significant country. Just a couple months ago, on December 9, 2014, Peter McKinley was confirmed as ambassador to Afghanistan. Can you imagine how difficult his job must be? Though the United States has been at war with Afghanistan for over 13 years, America is still making efforts to bring peace to this country by sending an ambassador there. Most ambassadors are appointed because they have good experience with public relations or else they're so close to their leader they know how he or she would act or speak in almost any situation. So, how can we be God's ambassadors? None of us will ever have enough experience to measure up to God's standards, nor will we ever be able to stand in his place. But, in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9, it says, God said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So, now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. We are going to fail, obviously, but God is glorified the most in weaknesses. Once we accept Jesus as the only power that we truly need, then he can use us. Because we are ambassadors from God, that means that we are here on earth on a mission. Jesus says in Matthew 28, verses 19 through 20, Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. While we're here on earth, we aren't supposed to sit around just waiting for Jesus to come. We have a mission that needs to be completed. This mission of bringing the gospel to the world is not an easy task, but God assures us that even though we may encounter problems on our mission, he will always be with us. Because we are ambassadors for Christ, that not only means we have a mission here on earth, it also means that once our mission has been accomplished, Jesus will come back and take us to our homeland. In Acts 1, verses 9 through 11, it says, After saying this, he was taken up into a cloud while they were watching, and they could no longer see him. As they strained to see him rising into heaven, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said, Why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. Now, if you look back a couple verses, you see that the man rising into the sky is Jesus, and the men staring after him are his disciples. Jesus has just commanded them to preach the gospel to all the nations. That same challenge also applies to us. He also promised to come back in the same way he left. In other words, just as Jesus rose into the clouds toward heaven, he will come from heaven in the clouds to take us home. In John 14, verses 2 through 3, Jesus says, There is more than enough room in my Father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. 
The Bible also tells us in 1 Thessalonians verses 4 through 16, 4 verses 16 through 17, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves. Then, together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. What the Bible has been telling us is that Jesus is coming back for us. He has not forgotten about us. So, Jesus is coming back, but when? In Matthew 24, verses 4 through 26, it tells us of all sorts of signs of his coming. There is only one that hasn't been fulfilled yet, and that is in verse 14, and it says this, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then will the end come. There's our mission again. Jesus is telling us that as soon as everyone in this world has been given a chance to choose between God and Satan, then he will come again. I don't know what it is about parents, but for example, if you go to camp, they love having a break from you, but they still get so excited when you come home because they missed you so much while you were gone. God is like our parents, except he never wanted for us to leave him. He can hardly wait to come and take us home. I used to live in Michigan where the winter time usually lasts from mid-September to the end of April. That's one of the many light, lighthouses on Lake Michigan, and this particular one is covered in layers and layers of ice because it was so cold. Now, I lived on a lake, a smaller lake, which would actually freeze all the way across during the winter time. We also had a swimming pool, and that would obviously freeze too. I really, really love swimming a lot, and normally in Michigan, I would only have about three months of swim time before it got too cold to swim anymore. When the weather was warm enough to swim, I usually swam about twice a day. Every day, that was the highlight, the main activity, the thing I looked forward to the most. Jesus feels the same, but even more excitement and anticipation about coming to rescue us than I did when I thought about going swimming. He literally can't wait to come and bring his ambassadors home. I found an amazing story the other, uh, other day that might give you a better picture of what I'm talking about. I'm gonna read it to you tonight, okay? It's evening, if heaven has an evening. Two figures walk silently together through the golden streets. The taller one is the master. The other is the angel Gabriel. On they walk through beauty beyond description. But tonight, the beauty seems marred by the strange silence of the two. They have come to the vast part of the city that is uninhabited. Just why it should remain so is hard to understand. For the homes that line its winding streets are lovely beyond words. The terraces, the lawns of living green, the rose gardens rich with bloom would bring tears of joy to any child of God who could see it. At last, Gabriel breaks the silence. Master, he says, all that has come from your hand is good, and these homes are no exception. They are beautiful as only you could make them. Again, there's silence, and again, Gabriel speaks. Master, when do you plan to bring them home? Not yet, he replies, and then softly with a look of yearning sadness, not yet. Didn't you plan to go for them long before this? Yes, his sadness seems to deepen. There is another silence, and then, Master, you know there's a housing shortage down there. Many have no homes. People are always trying to find them, and those that do have them, seem to be satisfied with earth. But master, the loveliest homes down there are only shacks compared to what those that you've built. I know, the savior says. Then there is more silence, and this time it is the master who breaks it. Gabriel, do you see those groups of people in all lands? 
the ones who are kneeling? Yes, Master. They are my people, Gabriel. They're faithful to me. They keep my commandments. They love my words. They tell others that I am coming back. And they pray, even so, come Lord Jesus. The master hesitates. Then he continues. But Gabriel, sometimes when my people feel that I am to come for them, I see a worried look on their face, as if the master cannot say what is in his heart. But Gabriel knows and turns his face. He has no answer for his Lord. A few moments pass, and the angel turns again, his face expressing the love and admiration that are in his heart. Jesus, he says, and the Savior's face seems to light up as Gabriel addresses him. He loves to be called by that name, which in a special way expresses his mission to a fallen world. And you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Gabriel pauses an instant as he looks at the nail prints in the Savior's hands. Then, clasping both wounded hands in his own, he continues, Jesus, you gave so much for them. He says no more, for even an angel cannot find words adequate to describe such infinite love. The tears that a moment ago were stealing down the master's cheeks now flow unchecked. His disappointment is so great that its intensity cannot be described. At last, motioning toward the empty mansions about him, he finds words. Gabriel, I'm so anxious to bring them home. I want them to be with me, here, where I am. Just imagine the times we're going to have. It's hard to wait, Gabriel. It's tough being so far away from my family. I miss being able to go on walks with them. I miss giving them hugs every morning. I miss being able to look into their eyes. Gabriel, don't they want to come home? Jesus gave everything for us. We will never be able to repay him. He doesn't want money, though. He doesn't need riches. He wants your heart. He wants you to love him back. His mission for us, those who love him, is the mission of bringing the gospel to the world. This mission is one that carries immense amounts of joy. It's one that shows us a little taste of heaven. Tonight, I want to challenge you, you who love God, to join with him in bringing more and more people into his family. Through God's strength, you can complete his mission. Jesus can't wait to come again, because once the mission is complete, Jesus will finally be able to see us face to face. As I'm praying, if you're willing, in your heart, let Jesus know that you're willing to be an ambassador for him, and ask him to use you to make this mission of telling the world about him accomplished. Let's bow our heads. Dear Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you love us. Thank you for your mercy. We want to join with you on your mission to bring the gospel to the world. We love you, Jesus, and we can't wait to see you again. Amen.
We all know that without Jesus' sacrifice, our lives would be meaningless. There is no way that we can repay the debt that sin has made. But Jesus was willing to take our punishment upon himself. He lived a life of selfless service, although most people refused to accept him. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus cried out to his father, begging him if there was any other way to fulfill their plan without going through the misery that he was about to face. Our Savior was beaten, spit upon, and betrayed. Did we really deserve his sacrifice? The answer is an easy no. We nailed him to that tree with our own sins. But we can have hope. In 1 John 2, 2, it says, He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Jesus overlooked his own pain, knowing that he would rise again and defeat sin. One of the most popular verses is John 3.16. It could be the only verse in the Bible, and it would still be sufficient enough to show us the amount of God's love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God's love for us is so powerful that he gave up his only Son so that we sinful humans could be saved. He also presents the simplest key to heaven. 
that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He offers us as simple as believing in him as a way to make it into heaven, to be with him forever. God loves us so much that he gave us the exact instruction on how we can be in heaven with him. Jesus left people devastated after his death. All of their hopes and dreams had gone to the tomb with him. It appeared that all was lost. The people had forgotten the measure of Jesus' power. But praise God, that's not where the story ends. God was counting down the minutes when he would be able to resurrect his beloved son. The grave was not destined to hold him for much longer. The final step for God's plan of salvation was about to be completed. On that glorious Sunday morning, Jesus rose from the grave to reveal his real power to those who had doubted. 1 Peter 1.3 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. His resurrection is something that we need to be excited about. Jesus lives and holds all of the world's power in his hands.
all the sins and terrible things we have committed on earth, God's grace is sufficient enough to cover our sins. He forgives unimaginable things, and he wipes our slates clean. It says in Isaiah 118, Come now, let, it, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. I don't know about you, but forgiving people is a struggle for me no matter how small the deed. Jesus was forgiving to those who crucified him. And what's even more amazing is that he forgave us, the ones who were the reason he had to die for. He went through all that and is still offering his forgiveness if we just simply ask, isn't God's grace amazing? love and sacrifice for our lives begs a response from us. We have been privileged to know what our Savior has done for us, and that is certainly not something we should be hiding from others. God is searching for people who are willing to serve Him. He is counting on us to share to the world His abundant love for them. It may push us out of our comfort zones, but He promises to lead us if we choose to be disciples from Him. In Matthew 28, 19, Jesus says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We need to learn from Samuel. When Jesus calls us to be servants for him, we need to respond by saying, Yes, Lord, I am listening, and I will accomplish the task you have set out for me. Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice for us. Can we not make a sacrifice for him also?
Bible, the disciples want to know what the end times will be like and what events will take place. Jesus' answer is quite terrifying. How are we supposed to survive wars and natural disasters? In Psalms 37, 39, it says, but the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their strength in time of trouble. This verse can give us peace of mind because all we have to do is rely on God and he will give us strength. Through all of the hardships and pain that we will have to endure, we can know that the outcome will be God's victory over sin in his second coming.
We were afraid that the water was going to be too cold. Well, it's just the opposite. <laughs> it's hotter than a hot tub, so. <laughs> You're going to see some glowing faces tonight. But anyway, um, this is really just uh, an awesome occasion. Uh, standing with me in the water is the young man who's going to be baptized tonight, Nathan Martin, and uh, the youth pastor from Fresno Central, Maurice Graham. And um, every baptism has a story, and this is no exception. Four years ago, um, Nathan's mother, Renee, who's down here in the front with her friend, uh, did, was thinking that she did not want Nathan to go to a public school in junior high or high school because of the many things that go on in public school. She just did not feel it was safe or a good environment for her son to be in. And so the Lord, uh, they were of a different faith background. They're Christians, but not of our particular faith. But they knew this was a Christian school, and I was just talking to Renee a few moments ago, and she, I asked her, why did you happen to come here? And she said, well, it's fairly similar to what we believe, and we have a lot in common, and she just liked the campus. And so Nathan has been coming here for four years. And during that time, he's got to know a lot of people. He uh, has appreciated the spiritual atmosphere on this campus, the friendliness not only of students, but of faculty who really care. They're like surrogate parents. And that's one of the advantages of Adventist education. And, um, and so as he listened in Bible class and heard the different students talking and praying, he said, you know, I would like to know more about these people, some of the Adventists. And then in recent months, he's had the privilege of studying with Mr. Lorenzen, our music teacher here. and our Bible teacher and as well as our choral director. He wears different hats and also teaches computer lab and something else, I don't know. So anyway, um, so he said that's new to me, but it, no. And um, so this last week, uh, Maurice and I had the privilege of just sitting down and reviewing things with him. And I'm really, really impressed with, with this young man. Uh, just before we baptize him, uh, Maurice would like to say a word. When I think of uh, Nathan, there's one word that always comes to my mind, and it's the word pleasant. Um, and those of you who know him would probably agree that he's always pleasant to be around. And uh, man, praise the Lord for the decision that you've made tonight. Um, there's a, a, a charge that was given to me years ago when I made this decision, and I wanted to pass that along to you. Uh, it says here that the greatest need of the world is the need of men. Men who will not be bought or sold. Men who in their inmost souls are true and honest. Men who do not fear to call sin by its right name. Men whose conscience is as true to duty as a needle to the pole. Men who will stand for the right, though the heavens fall. Such character is not the result of an accident. And Nathan's been intentional with uh, becoming this kind of man. And tonight as he makes this decision, I just wanna see by, by actually just, if you wanna join Nathan in supporting him in this journey, would you just please stand to show your support? Look at that. You have a family of people behind you supporting you as you move forward. And uh, by God's grace, sometime soon we'll all be in heaven together. So by being baptized, you are testifying to all of your friends here that you have chosen to give your life to Jesus Christ, to be your Lord and Master. You are joining not only an earthly family, but you're joining the family of heaven as well. Uh, when Jesus was baptized, there was a voice from heaven, from God himself, who said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And I believe right now, God is saying the same thing as he's looking down, smiling from heaven, saying another child has given their life to me. And so now if you would be seated so everybody can see the baptism.
our privilege as servants of God and as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ to welcome you into his heavenly family. And so, um, as ambassadors for Christ, it's our privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior from sin, and the Holy Spirit who empowers us to live for him day by day. Another child becoming a part of God's family. Amen? And there's going to be another baptism, so in just a moment, as we get out, uh, we'll invite Pastor Dennis Ray and Christiana to enter the baptism. Okay, if I just grab this. Uh, this is Christiana Kerbs. And Christiana, uh, I've known her since she was just a, a really little girl. And a couple things I know about Christiana. First of all, she's really, really smart. She has a very high IQ. Um, a lot higher. them, she thinks that she deals with them, and so, so Christiana has been thinking for a long, long time about baptism and whether or not it's something that she wants to do. So she's been thinking about it, she's been studying, and this week uh, came the tipping point where she just made that decision, and uh, tonight she's very excited to, to be baptized. And she's nervous, but mostly excited. Uh, as I was driving over here with my son, Derek, I said, Derek, what do you like most about Christiana? And he said, she makes me laugh. And so, Christiana, we are, we're all smiles tonight as, uh, as you get baptized. And I know your mom is right here up on the front row to take lots of pictures. And, and so, Christiana, as you are baptized, Church, I want to welcome. 